there, this is Lynn Hunter, L-L-Y-N-H-U-N-T-E-R, and we're going to finish a painting, we, or a drawing, and paint it. Um, this is going to be a bit of a speed paint. I'm going to try to get this done within an hour. This is 9 by 12 paint painting. Um, what I'm laying before you in front of you right now are the paints I'm going to be working with. This is my standard watercolor kit. Um, it's a standard palette, um, cadmium orange, ca or, sorry, cadmium white, cadmium yellow, cadmium red, alizarin crimson, purple or violet, um, ultramarine, cobalt blue, prussian blue, permanent green light, viridian green, burnt raw umber, burnt umber, burnt sienna. Uh, I seem to have my uh, my um, raw umbers out right now. Um, because that's burnt umber, this is raw umber. Um, sepia, Payne's gray, lamp black. That's my standard palette. Over here, this uh, palette right now is set up for the painting that we're going to do. This is an this is our Schmenka liquid acrylics. Um, I dilute usually um, one part um, paint to two to three parts water. You don't want to do it straight out of the bottle because they're a little bit too concentrated and too heavy. So usually you want to put in at least three to four drops of water for every drop of paint you put in. You get used to it after a while, but um, it's about one to three, one to four to dilute. This is an Indian red, sepia brown, ochre, ultramarine blue, and that's a lemon green with one drop of turquoise green mixed in. I probably want to put a little bit more blue, in which case I'll take some of that blue and put it in. It'll go a little bit dull, but that'll do it for now. Um, what I'm using the traditional for, I'll probably use my Payne's Gray. That's why I had the, I just wanted to show you what my, my standard watercolor kit is, but I'm probably going to be using some Payne's Gray and maybe some of the Violet in this, maybe some alizarin crimson. Um, I don't think I'm going to need them, but I might. So I just wanted to show you my colors first. And this is the painting that we're going, or this is the drawing, keep on saying painting because it's about to become a painting that we're going to finish up. Or the drawing that we're going to finish up. And I want to do it rather rapidly. So these are, this is my arsenal of brushes at the moment. You can see there's a wide variety of sizes here. There's a, um, about half of them are acrylic fiber in the brushes and half of them are, um, it's like, let's see here, this one, these are my Winsor Newton Series 7s. These guys are getting a little bit old. I have some new ones that are waiting in the wings, so I'm not worried about these getting damaged. Normally, I would stay away from using sable brushes with liquid acrylic because they will beat up your brush. Even, even if they're sable, they will beat up your brush and they're not really good to use with um, liquid acrylics. But because these brushes are already beat up, I've got some new ones in the wing, so I want to bring out. These have gone through the, the ringer for a while, and it's like time for me to use new brushes, so that's why I'm using these. And I always, if I could, <laughs> if I don't mind beating up brushes, man, there's, I still, there's nothing better than Winsor Newton Series 7. And I just got some red on there. Great. Okay, this is, this will tell you how I don't care about what happens to a piece. Ah, and then I got another smudge on it. Oh, great. Well, so we'll... Okay, I've had an accident. I accidentally got some red on there. I touched it. We've got it smeared. So what we're going to do now is we're going to use that pink in the composition. That's basically what you want to do. Whenever you make a mistake or whenever you um, do something that you didn't want to happen, throw it into the composition, and then nobody will ever know that you made a mistake. Okay, so... We are going to start with, as I realize I don't have paper towel. Most important thing in your other hand. Brush in this hand, paper towel in this hand. Or if you're left-handed, switch them. But I always have a paper towel in this hand for absorbing water, for blotting things. Um, especially when you're, you're working with water and you're not sure you know, how much water you've gotten on your brush. You can always take it over, wipe it off 
refill it until it's the right consistency. So with this baby boy or girl, I don't know, I think he's a boy. It's like what, what determines when, when you're looking at something and it does not have sexual organs, is it a boy or a girl? You know, we're still gender, gender defining in these days. Okay. I'm going to start with the sky. Um, get it out of the way. Taking in a little bit of blue. Let's see here. And I'm going to pull the palette over here so you can see a little bit of what I'm doing with the liquid acrylic and how I use it. Um, I'm taking that over into the, the palette here so I can have a puddle of it. And I'm, I'm going to be using a bit. Now you can see uh, there's this big thing of uh, water and it's just a little bit too much. And with the liquid acrylic, it gets concentrated real heavy, real fast. So and that's pretty an intense blue. So I'm using a lot of water. What I'm doing is I'm, I'm dipping into my, let's see if you can see that on camera. Okay. Sorry. So I'm working this. There, so I can see where it is on camera. Thank you. Um, but you can paint pretty lightly this and I'm painting this mostly with water. It's like I pulled the, the, the paint in and I'm diluting up the sky a little bit as I go along. Well, now one of the reasons why I decided to use um, liquid acrylic on this rather than straight watercolor and I will mix. If you get um, a little bit of your standard pigmented um, watercolor into the liquid acrylic, you got to remember the liquid acrylic is, is a plastic base. It's like you're, you're painting with a liquid plastic and watercolor is pigment in technically uh, a, um, a tree sap because gum arabic, the gum that they use in watercolor is tree sap and it recons it goes dilute with water and then it becomes dry and solid with um, evaporation and it's made from sap of the acacia tree so that's that wonderful tree it's I believe it's an African tree I think and once they discovered that the glue could you know you add water to it all of a sudden the glue dissolves you take the water away or it, it um, and it dries real fast and once they learned how to use that gum arabic um, it just was like the the wonder stuff now with liquid acrylic you're technically the base of it is the acrylic that is water based it dissolves in water but once it dries it's permanent so that's why when you mix a little bit of regular watercolor in with liquid acrylic, technically the acrylic becomes part of the glue that holds the pigment to the surface. And the thing is, is with the liquid acrylic is, is a very intense dye, um, or intense color, and it lays it down very fast. So if you want something to go pretty fast, it works very well and it dries pretty fast too. Okay. That takes care of our sky. Let's see where I am. Now I'm going to do the um, the rocks and the ground around it a bit brown and yellow. And I'm going to make our, our mule on the brown side. And I'm going to try to do him a little bit light first. Let's see what I'm doing. I'm taking a little bit of the brown and a little bit of the ochre because the brown is a little bit it leans, it's leaning to the black side or it's leaning to a little bit too cool. So I want to add a little bit of the yellow into this and then I'll add several brushfuls of water into this to dilute it. And let's see here. I'm going to paint our mule up. Yeah, that's a nice color. Now the mule um, itself has white around the eyes and its muzzle is white because of the donkey that it has in it. So 
so we get lay down the color on the mule. And what we're doing here first is I'll be laying in most of the base colors all around the thing. You, you want to get uh, just like um, with m most pieces, you want to get your heavy colors laid in first. Now what I'm doing too, I'm letting a little bit of foxing with water here and I don't mind that because I want this one is is kind of, of funny and funky so um, if I let a little bit of color blend in with the background that's not a bad thing. It also will bring pull the um, subject matter in the foreground into the back by doing that. Now the thing is too, you don't want to let any one area, if you're, you're moving paint around, you don't want to let any one area dry too fast because if you, especially with this stuff, if you let it sit anywhere for any length of time, you will definitely get a hard edge. And once it lays down a hard edge, there's no real way of getting it back up. So what you have to do is if you end up with a hard edge where you don't want it, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll go in and stipple something over that. I'll, I'll do a dotting pattern so that it looks like I intended that to happen. A lot of the stuff that, that actually some of the, the best things that have happened in my paintings were mistakes that I had to fix and I could not fix them with paint alone or I couldn't fix them by, by um, scumbling out the paint or picking up the paint. So I ended up um, fixing them some way. You know, you got to figure out some way of, of fixing your mistake and by making mistakes and figuring out, okay, now how do I change that? It's, it's not doing what I wanted to do. So how do I fix what I did wrong? Once you try, try doing that several times, what it does is it gives you an opportunity to find different ways of correcting errors because there's, there's very rarely an error that you can't fix, or if you can't fix the error in the way that you wanted to, not make anybody realize that you made a mistake in the first place, just by coming up with different solutions for making it look clearer or um, giving texture. I mean, stippling is a great way of, of correcting, especially when you leave a hard edge. Now it's like up here I want that hard edge because um, he's going to have um, a black muzzle but it's like if I want to see give that hard edge a different quality I can always stipple it up like that and then that that will change the hard edge and give some texture to his nose and it'll look like oh I meant to do that because you always mean to do that. You mean to do it because you, oh geez, I made a mistake and I don't want it to look like I made a mistake. So how do you make it not look like a mistake? So we're going to, and I don't know. I think we're, it's like, if I made him like with a dark muzzle, I'm trying to think of his, his wheels. I think I'm going to keep white um, because it's like towards the front here. If you have a mule, that has a white nose and white eyes. A lot of the times his legs are white. So I think what I'm going to do is give him that kind of a coloring. I'm going to give him white wheels. You know, normally on on um, on a jack, those wheels would be black. The the um, jacks themselves come in a lot of different colors. They they'll come in red and yellow and silver and um, a variety of colors. But with this one, I think what we're going to do is we're going to make him look like he's got white socks and feet. So we give him a muley color. Oopsie. Okay, there's a prime example. I stick. I stuck the uh, brush in the ochre instead of the color that I was using for the mule. So I just blotted it up and you won't know the difference. There, brown, not brown right there. Now question is, is that will he have a white tip on his tail? So you should see what mules do with 
The thing is, is that a lot of the meals I was looking at, and I didn't see um, their backsides. It's like, why don't people, you know, when people are doing research, it's like, they won't do, you know, they'll give you the, the side that you really want to see. They don't necessarily give you the side that you don't want to see. So I think that maybe his tail might be a little bit black, white. So it's the tip. So I'll keep it, keep it brown down up here and let it fade to white. That'll be good. And you see, it's like I'm not right here. The color went a little bit off, so it almost there's a line right there. So I'll come in with a little more color here, and then all of a sudden, this line right here isn't a problem anymore. And I'll probably change that that up even a little bit more as we go along. And again, that's why you want to start out. Um, a little bit lighter if you can and increasingly go darker if you're doing watercolor because it allows you for mistake correction. Let's see here. It's a, like a tree over here and I'm crossing over in the camera. Okay. There we go. That's better. And I'm going to make that, this bar would normally probably be silver. I'm going to make it all brown. There we go. Not sure about that. And I think maybe the bar in the front will make silver. Okay, now, since we've had a little bit of drawing time in the background, I'm going to take this red. And I think I need to add some yellow to it. There we go. I'm going to take it all the way. That's where I made the mistake on the side. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, I'm going to make sure. Because I can't just only have to look at my camera and say, how did I do that? Okay. And what I'm doing is I'm going to mix a couple of dots of red of the earth tone, the red tone. See, so I'm throwing in red. And then I'm throwing in ochre. And then I'm throwing in water and diluting it and changing it as I go along. So it's a little bit heavy. Put a little bit more red in there. So I'm thinking, you know, like um, if you've been to Bryce Canyon or you've been to various places in Arizona or Utah. The rocks are, or in um, New Mexico, the rocks have um, a lot of sandstone, has all these different reds and yellows. And I'm gonna, they're, they're very, the color is very intense now with, with the Schmenka. Schmenka is spelled, um, it's um, down below in the description. I'll have all the, the uh, different materials that I used in this. But Schmenka is, very intense. It, it's spelled S C H M I K E. Um, it's a German company. This is Schmenka Aero Color. So this is originally it's designed to be put through an airbrush. So they want the colors intense, and so that you don't that you can have it very dilute and the colors still be intense when it goes through a sprayer. Well, that makes it very nice for creating watercolors, for getting very intense color in watercolor. And also, um, as you can tell, because it's dilute already, it's not like I'm having to add any color to it. or um, It's not pigmented. Or I shouldn't say that because this is Schmenka. It does have some, some of the colors do have pigment in them. If you do get Schmenka, um, always uh, shake up the bottle before you... Um, dispense it because there will be pigment in it and you want to make sure that that if there is pigment in it that it gets into um, the paint itself when you put it in your tray and as you can see this is um this is a standard like puddle tray that you can get just about any art supply store you can get them uh, and you can get them online um, and also I like to get this is um, a cover that if you don't get done with your paints in a day and you put that cover on top, 
you can keep your arrow colors fresh for at least a week without them drying out on you um, so you don't feel like you're wasting colors because they will they won't evaporate if you have that lid to go with them otherwise if you need to leave your colors for like overnight I would suggest putting a piece of saran wrap over the top of your tray and that'll keep them fresh until you get have time to get back to it but uh, the the covers are really nice if you can get them um, and if you're going online you should be able to you should be able to find those okay. again I'm I decided on the red all the way to the edge because of my mistake over here and that's the thing that's how a lot of times some of your your best solutions come up from okay I didn't intend to do that in the first place but okay it worked out fine and that's the thing nobody knows that you made a mistake nobody knows that that was what you didn't intend to do in the first place but sometimes those mistakes can turn out to be some of the best things that happen in your painting um, the standard line you know it's like your cat walks across the painting leaves its footprints on the painting it's like oh my god I got to do something about that um, you don't know how many paintings were rescued and killed and rescued again by the pussycat so we're putting and again you can tell I'm just dabbling this through I, I'm, I'm occasionally dropping a little bit of the Indian red and they call it Indian red still don't know why um, maybe it's from India there we go okay so we got most of it and what I'm gonna do too let's let's throw a little bit of red and road just so um, you get some harmonization it's like you never want something to be one full color without throwing in some other colors that might die by the time I put gray up the road okay and I actually want to put a little bit more some spotting here because it's gonna be a plant And that, okay, that yellow is a little bit too intense, so and you take your paper towel, blot it out. There, that's better. Okay. Now, I'm going to go take, I, I like, Payne's Gray is actually one of my, my favorite go-to colors for a lot of things, just because it's got a lot of blue in it. And I love, you know, it's like you can mix your own Payne's Gray. It's kind of like you can mix your own blacks. Um, but Payne's Gray straight from this tube from Winsor Newton is it's just a nice color I like it a lot it's it's a dulled down blue that just is a nice substitute for where you would normally use black or regular gray and depending on which color it mixes with or which color you're mis mixing with you'll get a lot of wide variety of other colors out of it and it just it works for me in a lot of ways so I, I have a tendency to use Payne's Gray a lot for a lot of things in this case we're using it for the road and it's also um, it's not a stained color it's more of a pigmented color but it leaves a stain so it has a variety of um, applications it's like me and Payne's gray get along I gotta go back and do those stones I'm not sure what colors I want to do them yet or how to do them yet and a lot of times when you're doing watercolor that it's not having a plan in mind it's your your brain will have a vague plan in mind okay what am I gonna do here what am I gonna do here now that I've used Payne's gray for the road as, as I'm going through this I'm trying to think okay what am I gonna use for my shadow colors in here because right now it's like I'm still laying down my base colors and so I'm doing the opposite of sometimes what I do a lot of times what I'll, I'll do is I'll lay down burnt sienna and basically I'll lay down all my shadows first lay down where I'm gonna be putting shadows in a light way and that'll add that'll give me volume 
This one I'm starting with just laying in, these are my base colors, and laying in all the base colors first, and then I'll figure out how I want to add in the shadows last. And the thing is, is that you don't have to make that decision, you know, you usually either go one way or the other, um, or at least I do. And um, you can go both ways at the same time. You can start laying in the shadows afterwards, but um, I'm not sure how the color is going to be going on this. So a lot of times what I'm going to decide for the color in my shadows will be determined by the color in the painting. It's like right now, I, I personally I do like to use a lot of purple shadows. Um, that, that is another thing that I have a, a tendency to like to do. So I probably will um, use mostly purple shadows in this. As it's going okay that's looking pretty good now um got a, the final thing I gotta do is I'm gonna add some a uh, little bit of green to it now I this is um, I've mixed lemon yellow and just one dot literally one dot of turquoise green and see how fast it changed now there's not a lot of water in there so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this Take a dot from each of those. I'm adding a bunch of water to them. Again, the, the liquid acrylic, this stuff is really intense. It doesn't take much. Um, if you're painting with it, you get a, a little drop. You don't need more than like two or three drops of any color. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but you really don't need more than two or three drops. And I darken that down a little bit too much. So what I'm going to do is take the yellow that I've been using in the rocks and I'm going to add it to that green. I'm trying to find a correct green here. There we go. That's more like it. There we go. This, it, this is going to be like kind of simulating a, a semi-arid scene. And, you know, in, a, in the springtime, you'll get a lot of green in the desert. I grew up in Arizona, and uh, I am definitely used to desert landscapes. One of the things when I uh, grew up, I wanted to get the heck out of the desert because actually I first spent the first 10 years of my life in a hardwood forest where everything, you know, you could run around barefoot in the forest because everything was soft. You, you, you'd run around the forest, and my mom always was afraid I'd step on something. But in the forests of Michigan, they, they, uh, the likelihood of you stepping on something nasty is not real high. But in Arizona, I could never, never take off my shoes. Drove me nuts. Because everything there had thorns. Everything had prickers. So I'm just dotting some green around, making sure that I get the same kinds of green, get more of the yellow green down in here, there we go, that's better. And I did forget a little piece of the road there. Again, when I'm doing this stippling, it adds, not only am I indicating plant life, but I'm adding interest to the painting. So your eyes have a lot to find interesting. Go for a slightly smaller brush and let's finish off that road that I forgot right there. Oopsie. Okay. 
a little bit too dark, so blot it out. Now, what color we yeah, decide what color I want to paint the car and finish off the rocks in the front, I think. Adding the red, brown. See how fast it's like I just dabbed a whole bunch of paint, made it sloppy as heck, and then just blotted it up. And then I got all the, the different kinds of modeling that I wanted right away. So I'll do that same thing here. Where are we gonna make that car? I know. We'll use the we'll use the pinky red. Now I'm putting the pink red all over it because I know I'm gonna do the windows dark and I'm gonna do the tires dark. So I wanted to just get that color in all over it right now. Oh yeah, that looks good. Okay. Let's see here. Okay, now I'm gonna use I'm gonna use a little bit of it's like a heat crossing over in front of the camera, my apologies. It's like I will figure this out eventually. Um, I'm taking a little bit of lamp black and mixing a little bit of uh, uh, burnt sienna into it because the black is a little bit too ten intense and what I want to do is I want it that I've got the whites need to get grayed out. For the shadows. And the nose. Put a little bit of pink in that nose too. So we start doing some shadows here. And I'm not really liking the, the black shadows right now. It's... That's not doing that for me. I'll get some more paints going into there. There we go. Yeah, that's better. As I was saying, you know, when you do just straight black, just it never quite gives you the nice richness that you want. I don't know. At least I don't feel it does. I, I like a bit of, I like my blacks to be a little bit off and it just might be this particular painting. It's not working quite right for me. There we go. Okay. And I'm going to give him some freckles. Give him a little bit of a gray muzzle. So I'm modeling this with a brush, and that, that just looks a little bit too dark to me. So there. So we have a hint of this modeled mouth. Now the shadows. Um, hmm. I'm trying to decide what I want to do with the shadows on this. Probably could go. I'm gonna think I'm gonna take Payne's gray and some of the sepia, mix it together so I can get a, a blacker tone. Yeah. That works pretty well. That's um, sepia and paint gray put together. So it's going, it's looking a little bit black. But when it dries, it'll probably dry with a little bit of the blue in there. Okay. 
trying to get the, the um, sections inside the wheel here a little bit darker. Core shadow on the wheels. And what I think I'm going to do is once I get this darker color in, I'm going to take probably a little bit of violet and Payne's gray and color up the shadow, give the shadows a little bit more of a, uh, a color to it rather than just tonal. This is right now, this is more tone. We're putting in it's like underneath the nostrils here, giving shape to his mouth. Trying to get some more volume into it. shadow underneath even though he's going to have technically white wheels you still have to get the shadow in there and get it gray so you can get some volume to it and we need some gray or we need we need a shadow underneath them so we give him some height. You know, shadows are always difficult things to do. It's like as long as you fake it so it feels like you're doing the right thing. And because um, we've got distance from the head to the ground, there's a little bit of fogging in the shadow. It's not going to have a totally hard edge. And that's all depending on the sunlight, too. I mean, if you live in Arizona, I can promise you, the, the worst thing about growing up in Arizona and being an artist is every shadow is dark black and has a hard edge. You know, we don't have, you know, very, very rarely cloud light and no diffused light. It's like everything is freaking intense. It's either, <laughs> and the colors are all, unless it's during the sunset when the colors are insanely wonderful, um, basically the colors all get washed out. So when you're growing, you grow up in Arizona and it's like most, I hate the, the summer sun and how it really bleaches out everything. So anybody who talks about, oh, the colors in Arizona, it's like, yeah, during sunset, during the morning, but during the day when the sun is really out, man, it's, the colors are totally washed out. So. Actually, I'm kind of liking the, the, the blue gray in here. We'll throw, we'll throw a little bit of purple in the end, I think, though. Let's see. When you make decisions on colors. Okay. Now I'm going to give a little bit more texture to the, the road here. Because we're just about done with this baby. And like I said, one of the reasons why this painting can go so quickly is because you're you you're you're working with liquid acrylic, so it's not like you're having to add too much water to things already, and your color is already intense. So that's why I find that acrylic liquid acrylic it can be exp especially fast. If I want to get a job done, I don't have to worry about it. You're starting with 
paints that are too rich and trying to work downward. See here, I think I want to put a little bit more. Let's put some more yellow into the rocks here. And some texture in it. This particular yogurt, yellow ochre, is just it's really nice and rich and fun. Um, again, with, with the Schmincke, um, because it's so transparent, it's picking up a lot of the red underneath. And when it dries, it'll it'll have a nice variety of color in it because it it is very um, liquid. And too, when you're blotting it with a paper towel, you're you're adding texture too. Because every time it'll it'll pick up some of the texture of the paper while it's doing stuff. You can see how messy I'm being, and sometimes the messier you are, the better the painting looks. And what's really amazing with all watercolor is that um, after it's dried for several hours, it's amazing too how the color changes. How there's like there's some foxing going on here, and um, the colors when they start blending into each other, and the chemicals um, starting to mix with each other. When it's done drawing, it's amazing how, oh, okay, I didn't plan to do any of that, and it looks so much better. So, I, again, I, I always consider watercolor a bit of a cheat, but I love it. Because nobody, you know, it's like, hey, the water did, did that. I didn't do it. But nobody knows it but you. Okay, let's see what we can do with this car. Okay, because I want, I'll take the windows and make them black. They're not really black, but they're going to be dark. Okay, now that's too dark, so there. And I need uh, red tail lights. I'm using a I'm pulling off the CAD from my palette over here. Yeah, that's black. Of course, my brush wasn't cleaned out. Sometimes that is a mistake. Yeah. Pull this up from the bottom. That'll work. There we go. Just let that sit, and then we're gonna. Probably I'm going to pull the bread over the back. Put a little bit more yellow in the back here. Okay. And I forgot his mane, so I'm going to go straight to the... Um, I've got some uh, straight sepia here. I'm going to give him... a little bit of a dark mane. Let's pull a little bit more of that uh, brown towards the parts of the nose. And that's about it for this particular painting. I'm going to go back in with my ballpoint pen and I will do some detailing on him with the ballpoint pen. And uh, put my signature on it. 
and you can find it over on my Patreon, and um, I may be putting them up for sale as a print on my uh, Store Envy site, too. Give hmm. a little bit of darker shadow on there on the ground. Oh, boy, didn't that just pop everything up? Okay. I'll do it, put a little bit more of that under here, too. And then that's basically it. There's our, ah, one other thing. It's like, oh, one more thing, one more thing. This is it. Taking a little paint gray. So I've got uh, a little bit of shadow in the clouds. And just a hint. Let's throw just a little hint of pink in there. So it pulls it off the ground. And just a little bit of pink on his cheeks and in his ears. And one other thing, just a couple of strokes of the yellow across here and here. And that again is just to keep him from looking like he completely stands out from everything else. And honestly, when this is totally dry, it'll be amazing how those colors will all blend together. And again, what I'll do next is go back in, heavy up a lot of the lines in the background. I'm going to give them all whiskers in the front there. Oh, I forgot one last thing. One more thing. The last thing. Oh, it should have been my first thing. It usually is my first thing. His eyes. I got to color his eyes. How could I forget to color the boy's eyes? the one more thing uncle anybody who watched Jackie Chan adventures I'm a big fan of the Jackie Chan adventures the first, especially the first season Jackie Chan had an uncle that everybody called uncle and his favorite line was one more thing and one more thing and one more thing uh, we have to have the car with the flat tire because it's a car with a flat tire that needs a jackass 
to get it out of its situation. There we go. Done. Thank you very much for watching. This is Lynn Hunter, L-L-Y-N-H-U-N-T-E-R. Please subscribe and like the uh, video. I will be producing one of these every week. Please come and watch again. Really appreciate your stopping by. Thank you very much.